Down to Art, conversations about the creative process with your host, Christy Gordon. Today I'll be talking with Jacob Hicks about how to find your own path as an artist, which is such an important topic because today there's so many options for us as artists with social media and other DIY measures that it's possible to carve out our own place for everything that we want to be doing artistically. Jacob Hicks is a New York-based artist whose work has been shown in galleries and museums, including Gallery Hanock in New York City. He's also an art writer and regularly posts his art writing on Quantum Art Review. So welcome, Jacob. It's so good to have you. Thank you so much. It's um, I'm a huge admirer of your art and it's and everything that you do to like make a platform for other artists. And so thank you for having me here. (laughs) I feel exactly the same about you. I absolutely love your art. I'm like transfixed by it. And you too, like make a big platform with um, Quantum Art Review and everything that you do for artists. It's really interesting. So um, yeah, your work is so unique and beautiful and it just totally, I'm in awe of it. Um, I was wondering if you could take us back a little bit to just the process that you went through as you were finding your voice. Sure. Um, It's kind of a long and arduous journey, and I think you don't ever really land on anything solid because a voice is always evolving. Like in life, the only thing that is this consistent is change. And so I think real artists are always in the process of changing and that can feed sort of directly against um the model of the world that we live in which is very capitalistic that's like we want you to make one thing and we want that one thing to exist in a a price range and in a box that you can then push out to the world but um the truth is that's not really how art works it, it's amazing when you can have a focused, solid body of work that exists within those kinds of boundaries. But I think a kind of postmodern idea is that those boundaries collapse and we all do all kinds of different things and we exist in this like uh, further expression. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> so that like really totally makes sense. And it, um, it's it's like kind of a conundrum because on one hand, we want to have like a cohesive body of work and, and like find our voice. But on the other hand, we also want it to totally be authentic. We don't want to be like, like I've actually done it before where you choose a style and a theme and you're like, aha, this will be the thing that is my name or whatever. And you do it for yeah. you. And then you're like, I'm so bored. I'd rather get a real job. <laughs> like. You know, so it's it's like important to keep it authentic that um, so we're still like kind of exploring what really is interesting to us. But you've managed to pull it off. And I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about how it is that you have developed like cohesive body of work. It's very unified. And yet you still have total freedom of, you know, exploration as you're going. That, thank you so much. So what I think. In 2016, I started this current body of work, which is a series of 100 portraits of women. Um, I started it in response to the sort of hell that we entered when Donald Trump became our president and this fascistic energy that has to do with a lot more than just what's going on in America started. But anyway, there was like such an open um, sort of uh, misogyny and anti-humanism that I felt like, I think a lot of us felt at that time this same way that we had to make some sort of gesture to do something that was some kind of resistance. And my resistance is what I know, which was which is painting. Even though some in the face of like a lot of reality that can feel so uh, limiting, (laughs) but it's important. It is. Yeah. So the cohesive body of work came from this one mission, which was I'm going to make a hundred paintings that are a celebration of 
a really non-sexualized, iconic, but iconic in a deeper meaning of the word, like in a a mythological sense, a sort of godlike nature of women that is, uh, it's kind of a a problem because when you deify something, you're making it not real. But I wanted an iconic sense of real women that were not objectified. <laughs> yeah, and I think you totally achieved that. And like some Thanks. of the kind of like the visual like look of your work with the patterns and the like um yeah different colors but then juxtaposed with the high level of realism and say the face um like when did you start to do that kind of thing like you mentioned that your current body of work sort of extends back to 2013 do you see little like threads of that before that or when did this sort of visual language of yours develop and how <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i think i've got kind of two different natures of making one is something that I, I really solidly learned when I went to New York Academy, which is this um, figurative interpretation that involves like careful looking and rendering and recreation. And I, that, so that's one of my natures of making. And then the other nature comes in this like real uh, meditative, slow, decorative, like not looking at the real world at all, but sort of internal looking where I just like start with a pattern and I extend it and I do give it a dimensionality by adding like highlight points and like a sort of uh, like basic knowledge from a sort of academic sense where you can give a roundness and a structure. Yeah, I noticed that because I think it's like really hard. Well, it's kind of been a conundrum for me. I've wanted to include like pattern and decoration with the kind of rendering that we like are so familiar with. And it's it's been like hard to bridge the two worlds, but you've done such a good job. And in some ways, it reminds me a little bit of like Holbein too, because I was looking at him and he has, you know, all those patterns. But of course, again, his is like rendered and yours has more color. But it, um, but I, I think it's like, yeah, pulled off so beautifully um thank you yeah i noticed one thing thank you so much for going to my show and uh, having those some comments about it in the youtube video that was really a beautiful honor but one thing you said was right on target because you said it almost has a cubist nature my work i was like just throwing that out there i'm like this is kind of random i hope this no but on point. So, so when I started painting, I didn't learn to paint figuratively first. I started by looking at um, the abstraction and modernism, and I was obsessed with the cubists. So the majority of my original work is cubist in nature. So I think that that carries in, like, I can't do what you do, which is to make um a very realistic and believable picture plane that you can sort of yeah. delve into. Mine is real fractured. <laughs> I love that about your work. Yeah. Thank you. I'm jealous of what you can do. <laughs> well, I'm looking closely at what you're doing. Yeah, and it was like um just so amazing. So looking back at when you were at the academy, what like like are there like similar motifs with the patterns? When did the patterns start to happen? Like how I'm just trying to like sort of understand how the development of such a unique like and clear sure. like artistic voice and style could kind of come about. Did did you find that there were threads early on, but then it started to just really crystallize? But you sort of had to continue with this interest long enough until it did, or something. Or how did it go? <laughs> so when I went to the academy, I was really a, a novice in terms of traditional painting. And so it was a huge uh, excitement and challenge because that's like why I wanted to go there. to, Because uh, I already had this kind of self-constructed painting language uh -huh. and I wanted an exposure to a deeper like art history that's tech, like a technical art history. So I had that decorative nature when I went into the academy but the challenge for me there was to be like, oh, my God, there are these like world class figurative painters all around me that are doing the most unbelievable things. I'm like, how can I learn to 
create something like that and then merge it which with with what was my initial like artistic instinct <laughs> oh that makes sense yeah that's so interesting so yeah it really happened when the two crystallized like together yeah pivotal moment for you when suddenly you were like ah i found it <laughs> i remember so at the academy it took me a long time to understand really basic things like um i know you have the like most basic like drawing lesson where you make a sphere in space and you have shadow you have a light source and you have shadow coming from one side and the uh, dimension out like three dimensionality doesn't come to me easily, which is strange. So it took me a long time to conquer really basic uh, artistic understandings. And at the Academy in that initial year, oh my God, my work was so unbelievably awkward. I'm like, because it, because when you're learning that just happens. Yeah. But probably, um, it, when we went into the second year, when we had that summer to really digest all of the the technical learning, like my work was not anywhere what where I would want it to be, but that was when things started clicking, when those two different languages started going down a similar path. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and so it almost like, um, almost cr crystallized a little bit when you had some time to kind of contemplate and just let it simmer and yeah, yeah. a little bit of space to breathe <laughs> but my um my sort of technical academic painting skills because they were new to me it took several several years outside of the academy to really just sit down and understand the structure i'm really always have been interested in portraits i'm not so much interested in the body which is strange in painting mm. but i i really wanted to get a sort of map of facial structure like innate into my heart so that i can make things without having to think do you know what i mean yeah totally like that's when that's painting that. is the realist to me like when you're like just sort of in a flow state and you're not in this like intellectual zone. <laughs> totally. I was wondering like, as far as how you come up with your ideas and your patterns, do you do thumbnails first or is that even useful? Or do you just, oh. if you do a bit of like little sketches beforehand and then you start on the final, but does it kind of just evolve as you're going? Like what is the process like for you? So I always start with, uh, is this the right word? Imprimatura with mm -hmm. the, I just take like a burnt umber, like a, a earth pigment. And I just make like a little squiggly circle where the face is going to be. That's always how my painting starts. Then you almost always the faces have a reference, whether it's um, art historical from a photograph of somebody that's close to me in my life. I don't work from life. I'm terrible at it. Um, it has never been my strength. Oh my God, I don't know how you can do that. <laughs> it's hard. Uh, so I start pulling the face out first and then I start working um, really in a sort of traditional indirect method. Yep. But once I get the structure of the face, it doesn't matter to me if it looks like the um, reference, unless it's a real person, then I try to get a likeness. Yep. But if I'm working art historically, I just want something to respond to, which is that art historical face. Something really weird happens where my faces always look a little bit like me and they always look a little bit like my mom. <laughs> like they all have my mom's nose. And so I'm not going for a likeness as much as I'm going for an essence. And when I feel it in the structure that I make, um, excuse me. I then start to figure out what I want to do around it. I'm so all of the deck, I, I don't do thumbnails. I work very much like improvisationally. Yeah, totally. Which can be a big problem because I, I am a slow painter. Like I, I want the, I want the rendering perfect. I want the, 
any idea of a paintbrush mark to vanish. Like I don't want it. I want it to be totally like illusionistic. Yeah. Not always, but just with this body of work. Yep. And so when you get to that like fine level of rendering, but you're also working kind of improvisationally, it is problematic because you're like, oh my God, I worked my ass off for like a few months, like maybe a few weeks on a passage. And I'm like, no, that can't stay. I need to just like make like a weird snail spiral over it. <laughs> I know exactly but, what you're <laughs> um, So you can't get too attached to stuff because, yeah. and this is just a basic painter lesson. When you get too attached to a portion, it devalues the rest of the painting and you're like oh my god this is me emotionally clinging to something that in the long run doesn't matter anyway <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, and do oh, you but, little sketches beforehand or anything you just let it evolve like on i'm a real weirdo i'm honestly i would say uh, i'm a good colorist i'm not a good drawer so if i try to to pre-compose the image I will not like it and I won't be able to make it what I feel like it should be. Like it has to happen in the time that it's happening. I don't know if that, I'm making the sound all mystical and stuff, but it's just like, it's literally me just like sitting and playing and I'm like, is that cool? Does that look good? Yes. Okay. I'll do a different part. No, I'm going to mess in this area. <laughs> yeah. It's like real simple. Yeah. <laughs> uh no i love that though it's um it's like really cool to just let the work kind of evolve and follow your intuitive impulse and then judge it and just try things and uh, it's yes like, exactly amazing what you're creating i'm like um yeah just in awe um yeah but the problem is if you work this way you can never like do like a commission for someone or because if i'm I trying to like fulfill someone else's idea yeah. the painting will suck it will be a bad pay <laughs> yeah. like i don't have that power <laughs> yeah i totally can see what you mean because it's actually like requiring that full freedom like where you actually just let your impulse guide you but if there's any question as you're like kind of yeah. guide, then it's hard to let it flow or something no i know what you mean though yeah so i I teach kids and one thing that one of the first things that I always tell them when they're making art is I say, okay, um, there are so many places in your, your entire life, you're going to be being told what to do, how to do something. Art is where you, this is your universe. You are in control. This is where you have freedom. Like I like to allow that openness and, yeah. <laughs> now I know that there are, I'm also obsessed with the long history of what it is that we do. And I do think that there are like, I'm not like so loosey goosey. I think there are good paintings. I think there are bad paintings. And I like, I'm kind of Kantian and Caitlin gets mad at me about this because Caitlin Stubbs is my best friend. She gets oh. mad at me because she has a sort of much more open mind to what um, can constitute good or bad. And it can encompass a, a big world of difference. But in my mind, I've got this like weird, like, um, does this conform to a sense of what is good historically? Mm -hmm. Yes or no. And if the answer is no, then it is bad, which is so like, talking about like fascistic thinking that's not great <laughs> well but it actually makes sense too like right now i'm writing a book about how to find your voice as an artist and one of the chapters oh my God. Is in your world and it got me thinking about your role writing like writing for quantum art review and and how that might inform you staying informed you know about all the art shows and the art that you like and because when we have to write about it we have to clarify our thoughts and you're so good at writing about it um, oh, thank you. But that's important, like, because there are these questions beneath the surface. Even as we have total freedom on the canvas, it's we're still working it out into the slotting it into the bigger picture of what 
we understand historically and contemporary. And so staying informed as an artist is actually so important. What do you think like your, um, the importance of like, yeah, staying informed is or, and the role that Quantum Art Review and your writing for it has had maybe on your work and practice? So I love, Quantum Art Review is just this um, thing that I started when I was at, I think when I was at the Academy still with one of my friends, Angela Graham, who is a really amazing painter. And I haven't seen her in forever and I miss her. But um, I'm very, I'm really verbal. Like my mom is an English professor. And so I honestly think in a weird way, I'm more verbal than I am visual. Um, so it's just always like, I've just always had a lot of words about things and part of the way, like what you're saying that I process what matters to me is through putting it into words. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah, I think that's like so useful to have this avenue to do that that keeps you consistently like kind of doing it. I think it's like a really neat sort of way to just keep yourself current with with what's interesting to you and what's going on in your art world. Yeah. And then you like recently got picked up. Was it last year or was it actually two years ago by Gallery Hennock, like one of the top galleries in New York City? Um, and that was sort of after you've really clarified and found your voice. It just sort of happened naturally. Um, I don't know. Can you tell us a little bit about that? How, how did they find you and how's, how, what's that like? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Gallery Hennock is a wonderful uh, space that I feel intimidated anytime I go near it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> I, I am not the man to come to for professional practice because I do everything in the way that you probably shouldn't. <laughs> um, with Gallery Hinnick, so I got really lucky through the New York Academy of Art to be included in, it was one year, I think it's 2019 maybe, but David Kratz and Brooke Shields curated um, art a booth at Art Miami. Remember and that? they were really, really generous and offered me the opportunity to show work. And this is at the time when it's been about three years in me, into me working in this real consistent body of work. And I was so excited because the Academy is amazing, but it can also be like so competitive. And I always felt like completely like sort of invisible just like trying to figure out I'm like oh my god somebody there like actually saw me for something <laughs> and so they took I think one or two of my paintings and Hinnick had a booth that was nearby at the at Art Miami yep. and um oh it was actually uh Heidi told me because she was there running the booth she told me that somebody had come by that i think george hinnick I, I think that's his name came by and was interested in talking to me about i don't know what so i just emailed and i went and showed them some paintings and he was very kind and i felt like overwhelmed and confused in this big beautiful space like uh he bought one of my paintings which was amazing and then um put me on the website and sh every now and then shows me in a group show, which is so cool. Totally. But I, I'm really afraid to like, actually like ever correspond with. I, <laughs> uh, so I like, I never, the way that I learned to not mess things up is to just like not interact. So I think one time I had a lot of work. And I sent them an email that just showing some of my new things and they were so sweet and they were like, Oh yeah, we want you to bring a, these particular paintings by the gallery. And I brought them and I dropped them off and I said, hello. And then I went about my business <laughs> and like every now and then I'll be in like a group show and I'll be like, yes. 
totally yeah oh, you're so cute that's like so funny <laughs> yeah i know what you mean that like oh i don't want to miss i can't it. deal with it like <laughs> yeah. but the, what's interesting about it though is that like you got into the yeah the academy like you have connections so people like were watching you like because you've kind of already been like establishing yourself and stuff but then when your art when you really found your voice and it just really came together in this way which you mentioned is also like keeping it semi-consistent while not losing that thread of total authenticity and actual interest um yeah yeah and then it like naturally just when you found your voice it naturally like brought the attention of the academy and gallery henock like it just naturally started to fall into place which i think like happens when we really follow like first the first step was you really following your own artistic impulses and giving yourself that freedom to see what happens yeah definitely i wanted to just ask if you can think of it any other ways that you are finding your own way and carving out your own path so well i said earlier that i'm an educator i work with the queen's museum now which i love oh. and it's been really really uh I worked with the Children's Museum of Art, and uh, I was an educator for the Smithsonian for a summer. So museum education is really interesting because you can have the like intellectual, historical, and like real access to these magnificent things throughout history, and you can teach um about them and it's a space kind of for everybody and you end up not feeling so like like the new york art world can be really can make you a little bit jaded feeling yeah so and it can make you forget about the magic of art in some ways so being in this other space where you're with these incredible objects oh. and you can like see children's eyes light up about them. It helped me sort of fall back in love with making work to work with kids and to work in museum spaces. That is so interesting. I never thought of that. It makes sense. Um, yeah, because there's not the commercial aspect to like. Yeah. And this is something also for, I think, serious artists to think about almost every lots of museums have unbelievable like residency opportunities and Queens Museum right now has this thing called the Jerome Fellowship that the application is due pretty soon but there are opportunities to exhibit in museum spaces or maybe college academic spaces yes that and galleries are wonder are great too like I love I love all of it but it's just can be kind of something that makes you think deeply, feel a little bit like uh, competitive and hurt over, but also feel excited and good about. <laughs> totally, but it is it is kind of important for us as artists to like carve out these moments of like less challenge. <laughs> like it's still as challenging to like yeah. proposals to even museums or nonprofit spaces or university galleries that. But it's it's nice when there's a little bit of like yeah we just feel like it's kind of going along a little bit better especially living in New York it can be like yeah really like challenging and um, just a, yeah yeah and it's it's also good to remember that there are and I think every day more and more options are opening up for. Uh, considerate and considered artists to show their work yeah. like this is really like kind of retro seeming now because we're into the future but instagram was such a big thing for artists especially yeah. in its more early days because it was suddenly like oh now like people on a larger platform can see what you do outside of like coming to a studio visit or um being in a gallery you know <laughs> oh totally instagram really has opened up like so many opportunities there's a lot of people buying art straight off of instagram like you know like it's surprising yeah. 
me and then galleries finding people um yeah there's i i like think instagram's such a really empowering tool for artists of course the struggle is to figure out the algorithm and get your account <laughs> running okay yeah but, and i feel like now it's gone on like it's gotten less um it's gotten sort of more controlled and strange. And now all of a sudden I'm old and younger generations are on to different things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, like TikTok. Well, not that you're old. We're probably the same age. Well, maybe I'm getting older too. But yeah, I know even though everything like... Um, old, old is relative. I'm 38 now, which... I'm older than you. It, it's not old, but if... Like yeah. when I teach like a five year old and you tell them that you're 38, they're like, <laughs> oh my God, That's true. I cannot believe. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I also just wanted to talk to you, like we were talking a little bit before we started this um, podcast, just about how our, the thing about the artistic voice is that it does continue to evolve though. Did you want to just like touch on, on that and what that's like to see it continue to evolve and how to navigate that? Yes. Um, so I'm kind of in the middle of that right now. I'm only on woman 54 or 55 of my series. I'm a slow painter. And I'm having all of the, I'm like being pulled in different directions. I'm obsessed and interested so much with this new artificial technology that's happening. Yeah. And I've been playing a lot with uh, images that generate from verbal description and then like going back and reinterpreting those images with my like um, improvisation on top. So like this thing behind me is a mess right now, but I just like gave, oh my God, it's an unbelievable mess. I should never show paintings in process, but and for anyone who's just listening to only the audio, Jacob has like a beautiful <laughs> painting in progress. He says it's a mess, but it's gorgeous. <laughs> with many oh, you're sweet. <laughs> yes. Well, it was, I can't remember which program I used, but I just like gave a weird um, written description of an image that I wanted. I was like, woman at the corner, a uh, candelabra on her head jellyfish floating around blah 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 just like a real surrealistic thing mm -hmm. and it created this image and then i played with re-describing different areas and it would change the image and when it got to something i wanted i'm like okay that's what i'm going to start as a base of my painting and then elaborate on top yes so this is sort of a new direction i also I'm really excited. I'm about to be in my first museum exhibition at in Boca Raton, the Boca Raton Museum of Art. Congratulations. Thank you. But the weird thing about this is, is it's like a installation conceptual piece where um, it's a, a chat GPT AI bot that you, I like, for several weeks talked to it and told it that it, I like asked it to play a sort of part and its part is that it pretends it's a fortune teller mm -hmm. that is ancient. And it's supposed to like in a really like sort of wise wizardy way, tell you your future. And next to it is a projected video piece of a clip from an Ingmar Bergman film called The Magician with Max von Sydow's face being projected in this uh, crystal ball using a, um, an, a 19th century like theater parlor trick where it's like a little mirror reflection, but it makes it look like the face is actually in a crystal ball. So this is very like, um, left field of painting and it's i got really lucky to be invited to be in this show <laughs> it's, but it's so um, interesting because it does though knowing your work well i think it fits well into the themes it's just a different medium and it it also makes sense like what you said about how as your work's evolving the thing is 
the technology is evolving and things that are interesting you based on new technology are evolving. So of course that'll evolve your, you know, your actual work too. Like that's, I think that's a really good point. That's what kind of happens over time. Yeah. It's, it's also very strange because for forever I resisted the urge to mess with any medium except for painting because I love painting the most. And I, I'm like really a painting purist. I'm like, I'm not going to do anything else. I'm not going to do anything else. And now I'm doing some other stuff. <laughs> I love that though. And I, there's a lot of artists that are kind of interdisciplinary. I think it's, um, I think it's a really interesting way to work where you have a theme and you're kind of exploring it with like, yeah, different avenues. I can't, it's, it's fascinating too like oh thank you oh where can people find out more about your work and and everything that you do oh sure so right now i have a solo exhibition at an amazing uh uh store and fashion house in the lower east side called bobble house is it lower east? it's lower east side yeah. right yeah okay and it it's my first solo show in New York City. It's very, very exciting. So if you want to see my work, it's up through November 23rd there. Um, my Instagram is jacob.hicks.studio. And um, oh, and my website that I haven't updated in a million years is jacobhickspainter.com. <laughs> And I'll definitely include a link to those in the description. And Quantum Art Review, if people want to read um, writing, what is it? QuantumArtReview.com? Mm -hmm. It is. That's just been this passion thing that I just like, when I see a show, I'll write some stuff about it. I'll and then I'll be like, oh my God, why did I spend so much time doing this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that yeah. takes forever. Oh, yeah. but it's been so good talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us, Jacob. And I'm so excited to see more of your work. Oh, and I actually loved your show and I made a YouTube video about your show for anyone who's not in New York. They can still see your work there and I'll include a link to that in the description as well. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jacob. Talk to you later. I'll talk to you later. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Down to Art. Thank you so much for being with us.